things. Uh, have you fellows ever heard of Paraline before? If you've heard of it, you are in the minority because uh, Paraline is a very well kept secret. We're going to have a brief introduction here. We'll talk about the requirements for medical devices. Uh, then we'll have a brief overview of Paraline itself so you understand what it is. We'll talk a bit about the vapor deposition process itself, uh, and then we'll have a brief conclusion. So what is the role of polymers in medical devices? Uh, the role of polymers is to enhance the reliability of the devices uh, in which it is used. Uh, the medical device industry borrows from many other industries, and so these other technologies come into the device industry, and it is very important that the uh, safety and efficacy of those devices be assured uh, before they are implanted into patients. Implants is a, a major user of uh, microelectronics. We're now at the microelectronics electronic scale, rapidly heading toward the nano scale, and so it's important to protect these miniature devices. Sometimes these devices will need a coating purely as a primer for some follow-on coating, um, but in any case, uh, the, uh, the coating, the polymer, needs to be both biocompatible and biostable. I already mentioned the adaptation of other uh, technologies, uh, and the focus continues to be on denser packaging. Denser packaging uh, puts a special challenge on coatings because the coatings need to uh, uh, be thinner and thinner but still provide the same, uh, uh, the same protection. So manufacturers are always looking for a thinner, effective coating. I mentioned smaller and tighter multi-layer designs, uh, tighter lead spacing, uh, the need to protect from moisture and contamination because the packaging gets tighter and tighter, the temperature requirements go up too. Uh, tighter packaging means a, th a, a tighter a thermal load. Amongst all this, of course, is the need to protect uh, not just from the higher temperatures, but from the corrosive environments that these products are uh, placed into. The, the medical device industry, especially implants, is an exceedingly corrosive environment, so we need to very durable coatings for these types of products. What are some of the requirements for these medical devices in terms of coatings? Uh, you'll notice that the first item on the list here is adhesion. Uh, adhesion is extremely important uh, because no coating is any better than the adhesion that it can demonstrate. Um, that uh, is implicit in the term delamination and its avoidance, blistering, flaking, and chemical decomposition. Uh, when, when you have delamination, you immediately get to the next bullet and you have corrosion. So that's a very high priority. You also want the coating to be a pure material, nothing in the coating to outgas, uh, to leach out, um, or to be extracted in its application. You also wouldn't want the coating to be a nutrient source for microorganisms. Um, and in the end, uh, the last item there at the bottom I'm talking about is biocompatibility and biostability. Adhesion at the first, at the top of the list, and biocompatibility, uh, biostability at the bottom of the list, those go hand in hand. If you can't get that with a coating, then you have a failed coating. Here are some of the devices that can benefit from these coatings, and, and they're, this, most of them are, in, are obvious, but we'll go through them just quickly so you have a sense of the types of products. Uh, electronic circuits uh, go right down the list. Uh, through all of these devices, sensors, transducers, uh, devices that are both on the surface and ingestible, uh, cochlear implants, MEMS, if you're familiar with MEMS and MOTS, uh, you know that they are very, very small devices, uh, biochips, pulse generators of all types, implantable cardiac defibrillators, uh, pacemakers, uh, neurostimulators of all different types, uh, radio frequency ID implants, implantable radiation dosimeters, wheelchairs, electrosurgical devices, all kinds of ocular and cochlear devices, seals, probes, stents, catheters, needles, mandrels, and molds. And we'll touch a bit on those a bit later. So what is Paraline? Why would we use Paraline on a medical device? Well, this page gives you some of the, the features of Paraline, and we'll get into them in specifics, but Paraline is an excellent barrier against fluids, biofluids, drugs, uh, manufacturing chemicals, and chemicals in the actual setting. Uh, Paraline provides a, a complete 
uniform pinhole free encapsulation. It is highly conformal and ultra thin. And we'll, we, we talk actually in angstroms when we talk ultra thin. It's an inert continuous material that is applied at room temperature. It contains no solvents, plasticizers, or catalysts. That means nothing to uh, be extracted. Uh, it can operate at temperatures as high as 350 degrees Celsius, actually a bit higher than that. It has excellent electrical resistance. It's an excellent dielectric, and it can be sterilized by all the various uh, sterilization techniques that we use nowadays. So what is perylene? Well, perylene is a, uh, it's a unique series of polymers uh, created from xylene. Uh, the actual name is polyparaxylene, but we shorten it to perylene, and so that's how it is known around the world. Uh, even those people who know it as perylene may miss the fact that it is polyparaxylene. There are four perylenes that uh, we coat with, perylenes N, C, D, and perylene HT. Now, we won't talk much about perylene D because it has no biocompatibility uh, rating. Uh, it is used primarily in the automotive and the military industries. Uh, there are some other perylenes that are under development. We won't talk about those either. Uh, primarily because if I spoke about those, I'd either have to shoot all of you or kill myself, um, neither of which I have any intention of doing. This is the original par perylene. Perylene N, you'll notice it's strictly a carbon-hydrogen uh, molecule. It uh, provides very good uh, crevice penetration. Uh, on my next slide, I'll talk about this 40X, uh, as I refer to X factor, so that you understand what we mean by 40X. Perylene N has a maximum continuous operating temperature of uh, 60 degrees Celsius, short excursions a bit above that. Uh, it has a coefficient of friction at 0.25. Uh, many people uh, will ask me, well, how does perylene compare to uh, PTFD or Teflon? Uh, if you look on the web, uh, the internet, you'll discover there are in excess of uh, uh, 30 different types of PTFE. Uh, and they have a range of uh, coefficients of friction from as low as 0 0.04 to as high as 0.35. And so perylene at 0.25 fits quite nicely in that range. So when we say perylene is uh, slippery in the same sense as Teflon, uh, it's, it's true. And you'll see that uh, perylene N has all the requisite uh, biocompatibility certifications. Now, what did I mean by 40X? Well, here's a cross-section of a hypo tube uh, with an inside diameter of X. And what the 40X means is that if I coat the exterior of the tube with one micron of perylene, I can get down the interior of that tube to 40 times the inside diameter before the coating gets to half the thickness as is on the outside. So let's say that the inside diameter is one millimeter. I can get my coating 40 millimeters down the inside of that tube before the inside thickness is half of what I'm putting on the outside. That's what I refer to as the X factor, but uh, that gives you a rule of thumb of just how penetrating perylene is. All right, uh, if, if you want very good crevice penetration or you want low coefficient of friction, probably perylene N is useful to you. If you add a chlorine atom to the molecule over here, we have perylene C. And you'll notice immediately that it only has a penetrating capability of 5x. So if penetration is important to you, we wouldn't suggest perylene C. You will notice that its uh, operating temperature is a bit higher, uh, and it is the best in terms of chemical resistance and uh, low permeability to moisture. So if you want barrier properties, uh, from perylene, then perylene C would be the suggested perylene. It's only marginally less slippery than perylene N, and it also has the requisite biocompatibility certifications. Now, if we add another chlorine atom up here, I think my pointer just died, so I bring my own. If you add another chlorine atom to the uh, molecule, you wind up with perylene D. But as I said, we don't talk about that much. No biocompatibility data. Uh, for a long time, it was the high temperature pyrrolene until we came up with a fluorinated uh, polymer, pyrrolene HT. Uh, pyrrolene HT uh, is purely carbon fluorine. Uh, it is UV stable, whereas the other pyrrolenes will be degraded uh, in the presence of ultraviolet light. It has an X factor of 50, so if penetration is what you need, 
Paralene HT is for you. But really, it's the high temperature capability and the very low coefficient of friction that makes Paralene HT so unique. So if you have a high temperature application, for example, electrosurgery, uh, where there are some very high instantaneous temperatures, Paralene HT might be the one to use. You'll notice that Paralene HT also has the requisite uh, biocompatibility certifications. Vapor deposition polymerization is what we call the process by which Paralene is applied. It truly is applied in a vapor. Uh, means there is never a, 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 a liquid phrase. Uh, no meniscus effects, no pulling back from edges, no flowing, uh, controllable thi thickness, uh, very thin. Now, as I said earlier, the angstrom range up to the micron range, 500 angstrom at, on the thin end, 75 microns on the high end. And because it's so thin, very low mass, no um, distortion to uh, sensing surfaces when you coat with paralene. It is deposited at room temperature, so there's no thermal um, uh, stress on the item being coated. Uh, it's a spontaneous polymerization process, meaning there are no plasticizers, catalysts, or solvents within pyrrolene, nothing to leach out, nothing to outgas, very high purity. Uh, the word cure is probably a misnomer with pyrrolene because it's done the moment the polymer forms, uh, no curing process. It is a very clean, self-contained, and closed process. Uh, this sketch here gives you an idea of some of the shortcomings of a liquid coating. You'll notice a liquid uh, gravity tends to pull it uh, off elevated areas. So this lead here on this ungraded circuit uh, might not have the, the protection that you want. Uh, liquid coatings also have the uh, propensity to have uh, air gaps beneath or between components, um, invitations for corrosion. On the other hand, Paralene, because it's deposited from a vapor, totally encapsulates. No air pockets, no flowing. Uh, it uh, provides uh, perfect encapsulation. In fact, we sometimes say that Paralene defines conformal and uniform and completeness. Here's a good example of just how deeply Paralene can penetrate. Uh, this is a SEM photograph of some fins etched in a silicone uh, uh, wafer. You notice by the scale that the separation here is about 13 microns. The fins are about 13 microns across and if you look closely you can see a very uniform continuous one micron coating uh, on the fins. Here's a closer view. Notice what I said about uh, not pulling back from the edges. If this were an electronic component that you were insulating uh, for dielectric purposes, this corner gets the same protection that the flat surface does. So when we say uh, uniform, that is one of Paralene's strengths. Here are some uh, of the prime attributes for Paralene that help define what it is and also help define what you can do with it. It is both biocompatible and biostable, uh, excellent barrier properties resulting in excellent corrosion control, uh, not affected by uh, heat and humidity within its temperature range. It does not serve as a um, new nutrient source for fungus or microorganisms, so it's a, um, a very neutral source. Non-thrombogenic, uh, optically clear, uh, excellent dry film lubricity, uh, and you can see for yourself uh, these various properties here that we've already talked about. Now, if you are, um, if you are concerned about the restriction on hazardous substances, you might have started using uh, lead-free solders. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of something called tin whiskers? Okay, we have a couple people here. Tin whiskers uh, grow out of lead-free solders. Uh, here's some illustrations of uh, tin whiskers. If this whisker grows up and over and touches the, an adjacent circuit, that circuit is destroyed. Uh, it has been found by some testing done by the Boeing company that paralene is the, one of the best suppressors of these uh, odd-shaped eruptions or these whiskers. Uh, and it will completely and uniformly coat the leads uh, and, and suppress the formation of tin whiskers. So that's kind of a side benefit uh, uh, that has come about in recent years with the absence of lead um, in solders. Uh, some of you will be familiar with this. This is the ISO 10993 chart where you can describe any uh, medical product by how it contacts the, uh, the patient. Uh, whether it's on the surface or internal, and then how long it's in contact with the patient. For many years, 
USP Class 6 was the de facto biocompatibility standard, but it only uh, covered intracutaneous reactivity, systemic toxicity, and a 120 hour or five day implantation. Uh, we felt that was inadequate, uh, so we did this battery of tests, uh, which includes cytotoxicity, sensitization, intracutaneous reactivity, systemic toxicity, a two, 12, and 26 week implantation, uh, and hemolysis and uh, uh, partial thermoplast and timing or blood clotting. All of these data reside in our FDA drug and device master files, which our uh, pyrrolene coding service customers can reference in their pre-market submissions. Uh, this is just a review. All the pyrrolines uh, have been tested in this manner, and we've thrown in pyrogenicity uh, just for good measure to be sure that uh, that was an issue with pyrrolene either. Uh, reasons for coding with pyrrolene, isolation, device from body, body from device, uh, electrical insulation selectively or overall, uh, surface uh, lubrication, surface preparation. Um, I, I use the word priming here. Uh, we do a lot of coating uh, where pyrrolene serves as a tie layer, uh, where a subsequent coating doesn't adhere to the original substrate, but adheres well to uh, pyrrolene. We coat uh, a lot of silicone uh, to um, uh, decrease or eliminate its microporosity, uh, and pyrrolene itself is tissue neutral. Uh, the uh, bodies in which the test uh, coupons are implanted uh, don't respond to its presence. Uh, this is a, an abbreviation of the coating process. Uh, the, the major parts of the coating process, a vaporizer, pyrolyzer, room temperature, deposition chamber, and a cold trap, and a vacuum pump. And here's how a pyrrolene coating works. Uh, after you have fixtured and masked everything that you want to be coated, you put it in the deposition chamber and close that hatch. You then put the raw material, which is a powder, it's, it's known as dimer, looks very much like laundry detergent, that goes in the vaporizing chamber and that hatch is closed. The vacuum pump and the chiller then are um, operated and when the proper uh, vacuum level and the proper temperatures are reached, uh, then the dimer is heated to 150 degrees which sublimates it directly to a vapor. Uh, that vapor then moves into the deposition chamber where it's is heated to uh, 680 degrees, and that cracks it from a double mo molecular state into the monomeric state. The monomeric vapor then goes into the deposition chamber where it spontaneously polymerizes on everything, and that's the process. Uh, in very simplistic terms, I assure you. Preparation, uh, it's very important that you uh, keep particulate and um, oils uh, off the surface to be coated. Um, manufacturing and human oils. Uh, here's a sketch of a substrate with a piece of particulate on it with this nice transparent uh, pyrrolene on top of it. If you take a transparent material with an index of refraction and you do that to it, what do you have? You have a magnifying glass. And here's real life. Here's a substrate with a par particle and look at that pyrrolene right there. That curved surface is a beautiful magnifying glass and so you may be able to see this particulate post coat when you couldn't see it pre-coat, but it was there all along. Here's an example of an oily manufacturing substance that was on a stem strut. Notice that the pyrrolene nicely coated over the oily material, but notice no adhesion at that point. So that's a, that's a failed, failed product at that point. I mentioned earlier that adhesion is very important, and so we go to uh, some lengths to ensure that we get good adhesion. Uh, porous, um, textured or rough surfaces, mill finished surfaces get excellent adhesion. Uh, highly polished ones, uh, such as electro-polished uh, stents, uh, require some additional treatment, chemical, plasma, or uh, abrasion to enhance the adhesion. Paraline is an equal opportunity coating. It goes everywhere, and so if you have some uh, area on your device that you do not want to be coated, you have to mask it in some way. We also have not mastered levitation just yet, and so everything in the chamber has to be fixtured in some way, and you already have seen this. This is a very simplistic masking and fixturing technique. These are epidural needles which need to ha have pyrrolene uh, removed or uh, prevented from getting on the tips uh, and uh, re keep pyrrolene off of the hub end. And so here, this fixture and the masking is one high-density closed cell foam plug into which the needle is pushed to the proper depth 
and then a small polyvinyl cap on the top to keep the pyrolene off. The polymer literally grows a molecule at a time. Uh, it neither expands nor contracts, gives off heat or absorbs heat in the coating process, so no cure forces. I already mentioned it's never liquid, so we, we, see, we have seen how it does not pull back from the edges, nothing in it to leach out. In fact, we use pyrolene to prevent the leaching or extraction of other materials. These are rubber uh, drugs uh, container stoppers with trace calcium, aluminum, and zinc in them. With no coating, these are the parts per million that can be extracted. With a tenth, a half, one, and two microns of pyrolene, you can see how those extractables go way down. So pyrolene is an excellent barrier to prevent that very extraction process. Coating thickness is infinitely controllable from as thin as 500 angstroms to 75 microns. The coating thickness is a function of how much dimer we vaporize and how heavily loaded the chamber is. And as an example, pyrolene C takes roughly three to five um, microns per hour. So if we were to look at 75 microns here, depending upon this, uh, uh, these numbers here, it could take anywhere from 15 to 25 hours to get a coating that thick. So it's not an instantaneous thing like, like spraying from a can. It takes a finite amount of machine time. Some examples of uh, what we coat, mandrels, seals of all different types, guide wires, catheters of, of quite a variety, surgical tools, needles of all different types, uh, sensors, pressure transducers, pharmaceutical containers. Uh, on this syringe here, we might coat the needle for lubricity, the, barrier, the, barrier, the barrel for barrier or lubricity purposes, and the rubber bong in there for barrier or lubricity purposes. These are some long-term coating examples, uh, implantable cardiac defibrillators, pacemakers, drug delivery devices like stents and inhalers, cochlear and ocular implants, catheters uh, of the longer indwelling type, neurostimulators of all types, gastric balloons and cuffs uh, to help uh, people lose weight, uh, endotracheal tubes, a variety of laboratory devices, and the, uh, the syringes and the, and the stoppers and the capsules. Um, and electronic circuits. Pyrolene started out 40 years ago as a, as a uh, conformal coating for electronics. We still do a lot of that. Issues when you coat with pyrolene, we already touched on the quality and type of substrate, uh, surface preparation, that is keep the oils and the particulate off of it, uh, some attention to uh, adhesion, and then how do you handle it pre and post coat. Pyrolene, thin, never a liquid, no cure forces, no additives, excellent barrier uh, properties, chemically inert, lubricious like uh, the PTFEs, high dielectric, 7,000 volts at 25 microns, and we can in fact coat any material, almost any material that's vacuum stable, plastics, metals, fabrics, ceramics, paper, even granular materials. One uh, final word from my sponsor, we have 11 coating centers around the world, uh, three in Europe, one in Central America, five in the United States, and two in Asia. And our primary business is doing this coating for customers. If you'd like more information about Paraline, stop by our booth at uh, 2542, and uh, we'd be pleased to talk to you about Paraline. Thank you very much.